Well, to the extent any of you know me at all, you know me as a chocolatier down on Main Street in Middletown. Um, you know, we make chocolates and we do things for rock and roll bands like Imagine Dragons. And, you know, it's a lot of fun. I haven't always been a chocolatier. I've gone through a lot of different episodes in life. I've been a lawyer, a firefighter, uh, television news, and a few stints walking tightrope. Fortunately, not too many. I grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, back then, you know, everybody was looking to get a steady job, a job with a future, a job where you can stay at the same company and retire and get benefits and all that sort of thing. But that had absolutely no appeal to me. I wanted to try everything and, and then decide. First benign opportunity, paperboy. You can learn a lot in delivering newspapers. First of all, you can read them and you can pick up a lot of information that comes in handy when it comes to the SATs. But you also import, learn important life lessons. For example, the guy who tips you a dollar a week is spending a lot more money than the person who gives you $20 at the holidays. Right? And more importantly for me is I had somebody move on the paper who I thought would be a very big tipper. Uh, this family came in and uh, the lady of the house was Miss Aruba. Of course, she's going to be a big tipper, right? But it turns out they got behind with their newspapers. So I ended up trading for a unicycle they had sitting in the garage. And then they would say, we're going here, we're going there. And I'd say, can I come too? And they'd say, no, go away. But they always took me anyway. And so that gave me an early introduction to studios, voiceover studios, TV studios, film studios, and so forth. Next benign opportunity, typing. In high school, I had a bunch of jobs. Um, I worked at a radio station. I got an FCC engineering license. I started running a cable TV system that ran between all the hotels in the Condado area of San Juan. And one day I got out of work and I looked across the street and there's a, a wire service office, United Press International. So I said, oh, I'll go over there and see if I can get a job. Well, they said, well, we have only one job opening it's for a teletype operator, bilingual, and you have to be able to type and type really fast. Well, I didn't know how to type at all, let alone fast. And at my high school, the only people allowed in typing class were girls. Guys just weren't allowed. So I had to get special permission from the headmaster to be able to go into typing class. Now, as you can imagine, at first, everybody made fun of me. Because, hey, guys in the typing class with all the girls. But then they realized I was the fox in the hen house. <laughs> that changed everything. More importantly, I learned how to type, and I learned how to type really fast. And not only did I get that job at United Press International, but later on in life, when I was trying to break into advertising and was told the only job opening was that of a secretary, I got that job. Next benign opportunity, skateboarding. Back in the days when skateboard wheels were made out of resin mixed in with ground up walnut shells, um, I took my skateboard to physics class mainly to annoy the teacher. But it turned out that she was able to show us all sorts of ways that physics could make our skateboarding a little bit more skillful. But more importantly, she put me in for a National Science Foundation scholarship. And I went up to the University of Delaware between my junior and senior years and I got to play with fiber optics. I got to play with computers when they were the size of this building. Um, I got to play with all sorts of different things, um, including lasers. Got to learn how to make circuit boards from scratch and things that would fit into little transmitters in the size of a lipstick case. Next benign opportunity, a year abroad. I wanted to study film and television in college. I also wanted to hedge my bets on a major, so one of the things I did is I filled out an interdisciplinary major form, and I went through that college catalog one night, and I put down every course that sounded like it might be even remotely interesting. And I put that in so I didn't have to worry about what to call my major once I decided what to call it. More importantly, though, the big uh, film schools at the time, NYU and UCLA, had uh, pretty substantial lab fees that I didn't think I could afford. But I realized that the University of Leeds in England was setting up something new with the Center for Television Research. And through the year abroad program, I could go over there and work in a state-of-the-art facility and no lab fees. 
So I had a lot of fun. Uh, made a bunch of films. My first film was on how to put in a heart valve. So we're in the operating room. I'm supposed to be the gopher. My, my teacher's supposed to be the one up on the ladder, you know, overlooking the patient. And he's there. And the surgeons make that first cut. And he falls down off the ladder. They drag him out. And they say, OK, your turn. So OK, that's my film. And I got biology credit, too. So it all worked out pretty well. Um, and later, those people would come in and out of my life, um, as you'll see. Benign opportunity, law school. I was working in advertising and working in public relations, uh, having first nosed in the door as a secretary, and um, had an opportunity to get a scholarship to go to law school in Washington, DC. So that's what I did. And you can see me studying in the law library. Very studious, huh? Yeah, yeah. OK, a little straighter back. So anyhow, um, I was looking for a summer associate's job like every other law student. And I was sending out resumes, and I was getting nowhere. And uh, but you know, in Washington, DC, every self-respecting law student knew where to eat at least once a day and eat well. And that was because all of the hotels up and down 16th Street, all the way down to the White House, every day there was a conference of some sort. Every conference had a luncheon. Every luncheon had a steamship round. As long as you had a suit on, had a smile, you got fed. <laughs> so one day I came out of the hotel, and I'm feeling good. I'm in a suit, well fed. I look across the street, and there's Washington's biggest law firm. Eh. I was afraid to send them a resume, but I figured I'd walk across the street and see what was up. So I went in, and they said, oh, we only have one job opening. We need somebody bilingual who has a background in advertising. So I got that job. <laughs> so while I was at uh, this law firm, Covington and Burling, I had a chance to meet another benign opportunist, an attorney by the name of Richard Kopik, and you can sort of barely see up there. He was a very young attorney. He had a pro bono case on behalf of an island off the side of Puerto Rico called Culebra. And the people on the island were a little tired of being bombed by the Navy because World War II was over. They had no problem with it being used as a bombing range, you know, when, when the war was going on. But now it was over, and they thought, eh, maybe it's time to get that to stop. So, OK, there he is with this little pro bono case. And you know, everybody's patting him on the back. Yeah, yeah, you're doing the good thing. And all of a sudden, the government of Puerto Rico changed. That little pro bono case started generating megabucks. I mean, serious money. They made him partner so fast it made your head spin. And um, as we pursued the case, we kept losing, losing, losing. But then, thanks to benign opportunism, Attorney Kopey can notice that while he was on the beach down there, he saw some turtles coming up and laying eggs. Could those turtles be on the Endangered Species Act? Yep, bombing stopped. All right, so, oh, while I was down there, I also, as you can see, the unicycle keeps coming back to haunt me. Um, I met a circus performer there. He was with the King Charles Review with the Ringling Brothers Circus. And uh, we were out on a stroll one night, so to speak, on unicycles. We got uh, busted for riding a bicycle on a city sidewalk. Never mind it wasn't a bicycle. Never mind that I wrote the bicycle regulation for the Washington, D.C., and I knew that it wasn't illegal in that particular area. It's illegal down by the White House and the Federal Triangle. But uh, the police officer wasn't having any of it. Crowd gathered around. They started calling him a few choice names. Next thing you know, we're off in jail. We're being charged with inciting a riot. Now, they gave me the opportunity to take a hike and leave him in jail. And I said, no, if he stays, I stay. So to this day, we're very close friends. I'm the godfather to one of his kids. And he taught me some stuff about unicycling that I was later able to parlay into uh, tightrope walking. All right, now we get to TV news. Um, I come out of uh, this whole law school experience and this uh, law practice experience, and uh, I'm clicking for a judge and all that kind of stuff, and then I get a job at the Federal Election Commission writing federal campaign finance regulations for federal presidential campaigns, and I'm getting really bored. I mean, I'm making good money, you know. Life's not so bad, but um, I, I, there's something missing. Well, fortunately for me, these same guys who were my professors back at the University of Leeds decided to take over Norwood Studios. 
They say, hey, we want you to be our lawyer. We want you to go and sell pictures for us. And uh, we want you to be our American representative. And I said, well, wait a minute. I don't know anything about film law. And they said, hey, get a book, get on a plane. So that's what we did. That's me at the Cannes Film Festival back in my Chippendale days. We're all skinny. And uh, we made a bunch of movies, some of which uh, came out under different titles. You know, we're running around the world, we're selling films, we're having a good time, but everything comes to an end, so I'm back in the States and uh, trying to figure out what to do next. And across my desk comes a letter from a little TV station out in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Now, back when I was trying to figure out what to do uh, after law school, I sent my uh, name and a resume and a tape into a, 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 a data bank for people interested in becoming television news reporters. And I didn't hear anything for years, so I sort of kind of forgot about it. But there I am, I came back, and there's this letter from a little Green Bay TV station, and uh, they want me to come up for an interview. They want to look for a people's lawyer. Somebody could demystify the law, make it easy to understand, fun to learn about, and also do some investigative news reporting. So off I go to Green Bay, I figure, well, you know, yeah, it's a pay cut, but it's a way to get in the television news, right? So back then, the way they did job interviews, so they'd take you out to dinner, get you drunk on cheap wine to see what kind of drunk you were. Fortunately for me, they liked happy drunks. And so I'm putzing along in there, and I'm working in TV news up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's my first year, and um, it's interesting, you know. Um, and my boss says, wait, you ought to send a tape into this Rookie of the Year contest. I said, okay. So I put together a reel, sent it off, didn't any hear anything for a while, forgot about it. And then the phone rang. Turns out I won. So that's me with Walter Cronkite in Vegas. Walter Cronkite, for those of you who are too young to know, was a preeminent uh, television newscaster on CBS. And a big shot back in the day. Um, so there I was, you know, in the penthouse suite of uh, a Vegas hotel. I got my family and friends with me, and Walter Cronkite singing my uh, praises down on the uh, floor of the convention center in front of a whole bunch of news directors. So the next thing you know, I'm in New York at NBC. These are some pictures of me back in the dorky days. Well, I'm not dorky anymore? Oh, I don't know about that. Um, but anyway, um, that was it, and so I was having a good time seriously making more money than I was making in Green Bay, Wisconsin, for sure. Um, but in TV news, it's like sports. You get traded. Teams get traded. People get traded. And I ended up coming to Hartford as an investigative news reporter for Channel 3, which will bring me to firefighting in just a second there. So uh, once I got settled at Channel 3, um, local volunteer fire department knocks on my door and says, hey, uh, you ought to come and hang out with us, you know? So I figured, hey, firefighting, a little adrenaline rush, kind of exciting. Um, and then it got real exciting because I realized that this little fire department had a nuclear power plant right in this town. This what used to be right across the river. It's now gone. The uranium's still there, but the power plant is gone. And then had him neck. And so this little tiny fire department had state-of-the-art equipment, but more importantly, state-of-the-art training. I got so much training that I ended up becoming an instructor up at the Connecticut Fire Academy and for Hartford. Um, and I ended up writing articles for you know, Fire Engineering Magazine on, on how to deal with hydrogen fires. And that was something I first learned about at that nuclear power plant when they used the hydrogen to cool all those ball bearings for the generators. Um, I was getting a little old in the tooth, long in the tooth, as they say, to go into burning buildings. And um, I mean, I could have continued going in, but I probably would have endangered somebody else trying to save my sorry butt. So um, I was looking around for something else to do, and I didn't want to do a desk job. So some of the guys at the fire department said, well, you like to cook, and you certainly like to eat. Maybe you should send a tape into the next Food Network star competition. We dare you. All right, so fine. You know, there I go. Set it in. And... Um, I started thinking, ooh, this could be hard. Maybe I should learn how to do something other than making spaghetti and meatballs, you know? Um, so I decided I would try to work my way into some high-end restaurants and see if I could pick up a few tricks. So I went through a couple of wine tastings so they'd know my face, and then I 
Went in between lunch and dinner, which is the time to always look for a job in a restaurant business, never go in during lunch or dinner to try to get a job. And um, ended up doing scratch Italian and then scratch French, molecular gastronomy, little stint in New York at a bistro there. And then finally settled into pastries at a restaurant up in Glastonbury called Tango, which no longer exists, but it was an Argentine restaurant. For those of you who don't know, Argentine is basically Italian cooking with a Spanish accent. Okay. So, um, and um, so while I'm there as a pastry chef, my nickname was uh, What Happened Was, because I'd screw things up all the time. But they didn't fire me because I come back on my own time to fix everything I messed up. One day in the mail, I get a coupon. It's from the CIA, the other CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. <laughs> and uh, they have a bunch of continuing education courses. And one of them is called Chocolates for the Hot Kitchen. Wow. Course is offered in January. February is Valentine's Day. No brainer. I'm going to go. I'm going to become a hero. This is going to be awesome. But as, uh, and I went to the class, you know, and I came back, I learned a lot. And I came back and I went down to the restaurant supply and I bought their best chocolate. But as that Tower of Power song goes, a little knowledge can be a very dangerous thing. And I didn't know that chocolate came in different viscosities. There's, uh, you know, thin chocolate and there's thick chocolate and I bought some sludge. I mean, this stuff was perfect for making a cake or a pudding, totally inappropriate for moldy work. So I fell flat on my backside. Now I'm looking around for a place to apprentice to figure out where I've gone wrong. And a lot of places are sort of turning me around because they've seen me as an investigative news reporter and they don't want me in their kitchen debunking all the mythology about cacao percentages, which is mostly smoke and mirrors. Unless you know exactly what kind of stuff you're getting out of that cacao percentage in terms of cocoa butter or dark dry solids. Um, but the little lady who had the shop on Main Street before me, mm. all she wanted to know is how much I wanted to get paid. And I said, nothing. She says, you can start tomorrow. <laughs> of course, I didn't know that she was looking to unload the place. That's another whole story. But eventually I got talked into buying it. We set up in the year of the not so great depression, 2009, and here we are. And uh, it's all about benign opportunity. I mean, I mean, some people could call it serendipity, but I think it's just more about taking advantage of opportunities as they came along. And so I would encourage all of you to become benign opportunists. Build relationships. Those same people I met in England, not only did they bring me to the Cannes Film Festival, later on when it was Hartford, they flew me across the Atlantic and I did shows over in England. I did about five, six, seven different TV shows uh, on Channel 4 over there. You never know who's going to bring you into their world and how that's going to work out. So build those relationships. Be trustworthy. Take calculated risks. Don't go nuts, but take calculated risks and do what makes you happy and uh, live the life you've always dreamed of. Thank you. <laughs>